Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about the work package that I've been doing. So I've been working with this uh, with Rebecca as well as some of these collaborators here. So first of all, why I think this project is important is because I think it goes without saying that diet is a major modifiable health behaviour having an impact on a whole range of health outcomes. But it's a really controversial topic and it receives a lot of public attention, a lot of public criticism and scientific criticism. And so I think the longitudinal studies in CLOSER provide a really nice resource where we can examine both the contextual factors that drive dietary intake and some of the health outcomes that are the consequence of this. And what I think is really nice about CLOSER is that we can potentially look at longitudinal and secular trends in dietary intake. But this is a lot easier said than done because measuring diet isn't easy, to put it mildly, and it's probably why it hasn't um, been looked at across the cohorts before. So this is an example from the 1946 British birth cohort from participants when they were aged four years. And this is just, just how diet was um, assessed at this time point. So if you take a minute and try to answer this question yourself. So what did you have for breakfast yesterday? If it was cereal, how much cereal did you have? What type of milk did you use? And would this answer be different if I asked you of a Sunday or if I asked you 10 years ago? So this kind of gives you um, an idea of why diet is so difficult and some of the, it's not really just a straightforward question to ask. So why is it so difficult to study in, co in cohort studies? <coughs> well, first of all, what do you mean when you use the term diet? What are you interested in, in measuring? Are you interested in looking at total energy intake, a specific macro or micronutrient? Another food component, are you interested in a specific food group like fruit and vegetable intake or a specific dietary pattern, like are you interested in looking at Mediterranean diet or just what people are consuming overall. Diet is also a really complicated exposure because it's a result of really complex political, cultural and social circumstances. And as well as this considerable between-person variability, there's a lot of within-person variability. So diet can vary depending on things like age, seasonality, what day a week you're interested in, uh, specific working patterns, illness, holidays, and a whole range of other um, individual factors. Diet can also vary in terms of its food composition then. So for example, manufacturers might change their composition of different food products over time. Um, there can be fortification of different uh, food products, and even soil composition can affect the nutrient components of different foods. This, is more, this variation is more important for micronutrients like selenium rather than total energy, but it's still a factor that you need to consider. So in addition to all of this variation, you have decisions on the other end of things. Once you, once you try to capture dietary intake, you need to make decisions in terms of how you code it. If someone says they eat a lasagna, what is a lasagna? What does that consist of? Do, is there specific vegetables in that, for example? There's also issues of measurement error, misreporting, Although in nutritional epidemiology, there has been a lot of work done in terms of understanding underreporting, and you can control for that statistically, but, there, but these are all things you need to take into account. Mm -hmm. So the problem with dietary studies is usually there's small effect sizes in observational studies, so it's, it's very difficult to know whether this might be um, an underestimation due to some measurement error or whether this is an overestimated due to some sort of bias. So given all of this, why do we bother studying diet at all? And there has been uh, some criticism of it in terms of nutritional epidemiology, whereby observational claims just aren't really coming through in some of the trial data. And actually, perhaps diet is just too complex for questionnaire methods to capture. There's just way too much confounding and bias. But there's also been um, some really good uh, examples of nutritional epidemiology. And there's been a lot of improvements in the validity of these dietary assessment methods. And as well as just in the overall design and analysis of observational studies as well. And I think one of the most important things uh, for nutritional epidemiology is that while randomised control trials are really good in terms of controlling for confounding and um, reverse causality, you just can't capture really long-term dietary intake in these studies. And that's why th these sort of studies are important. So while it's not perfect, and probably never will be, with I think with good knowledge and cautious interpretation, we can really maximise what we have in the closer studies to inform policy. So the main objective of my project was just to document and describe the available dietary intake that we currently have in the closer cohorts. And I'm hoping that the main impact of this will be to support future researchers in actually using this dietary intake and also maybe prepare the cohorts for the next advancement in nutritional um, epidemiology 
and for example, looking at uh, dietary intake in relation to metabolomics or something like that. So these are the main milestones for this project to date, and you'll see most of them have been just around the documentation and description of the closed circle words. And so the main output of this uh, project will be a metadata report. I'm all going to go through the sections um, of what will consist of this metadata report. So I think most of you are familiar with CLOSER, but just as a brief overview, these are the studies that are included in the um, CLOSER cohorts, and you can find way more information about this on the website. I'm not going to go into detail of each of these here. So for the first section of the report, I'm going to point to other resources that have outlined dietary assessment tools. So the DAPA toolkit and the Nutri toolkits are MRC funded um, projects that outline dietary assessment tools in detail. So these give you really nice resources of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of dietary assessment uh, tools and point to what ones you should be using. But overall, what dietary assessment asks is what was eaten, how much and how often. And there are a number of ways you can assess this. So there's some objective measures like direct observation and duplicated diets, but these are really um, burdensome heavy and they're just not uh, feasible for big studies. They're just, uh, there's too much work involved in those. There's also biomarkers, but these um, biomarkers are for a specific component of diet and often you need, you need to know exactly what you want and sometimes there isn't a specific biomarker for what you want to look at. <coughs> There's also more subjective measures of dietary intake, so things like food diaries, 24-hour recalls, and food frequency questionnaires that have been used. So I'm going to go through uh, two of the ones that we've used, that have been used generally in the closed circle words, which is the food diaries and food frequency questionnaires. So food diaries are prospective methods of assessing diet. So they ask the participant to record everything they've eaten and, and drunk over a period of a few days, or usually three to five days, and they're usually measured in household measures, so number of slices of bread, uh, teaspoons of sugar, things like that. And these are really detailed um, estimates, and they're good estimates of short-term total intake. And depending on how they're designed, they can capture different contextual situations as well. But they're not suitable for retrospective studies, and if you don't consume food regularly, you might actually miss that across the food diary, so there's the potential for that as well. They're also, as you can imagine, quite difficult to code because there's quite a lot of information, so they can be quite expensive on that end of things. Food frequency questionnaires uh, then are retrospective methods, so they ask how often a participant has consumed a particular food or food group over a period of maybe three months, um, something like that. And what, what they can do is capture irregularly consumed foods, depending on how they're designed, and they tend to have a lower researcher and participant burden. But depending on what food list is used, they, they mightn't be comparable across studies if different studies have used different food lists. So that's something to take into account. And it also requires good participant memory. So in terms of the next section of the metadata report, I'm going to just document exactly how diet was collected in each of these studies. So this is an overview of, of each of the closer uh, studies and the years um, that uh, diet was assessed in each of these. So you can see for NSHD, the 1970 birth cohorts, Hertfordshire, Southampton and Alsbach, these have all used these sort of validated dietary assessment tools like the food frequency questionnaires and diet diaries. There, all of the other studies have asked diet questions, but not necessarily in these specific um, assessment tool formats. So I'm going to just talk to you about two of the birth cohort studies, uh, Southampton Women's Study and Understanding Society, and outline how, how they've actually looked at diet. So in the NSHG, which is the 1946 British birth cohort, diet was assessed at all of these time points. So when they were children, there was a 24-hour recall, like I showed you in the previous slide. And then in adults, we actually looked at five-day estimated food diaries. And in the most recent um, uh, data collection, there were some diet-related questions but again, these weren't the specific di diary ones. So what, I, what I'll do after that then is talk about how the nutrients were extracted from it. So as I said, this is really complex. So you have to determine the portion size from the household measures that people reported. And it was linked to uh, food composition tables. And there has been specific software developed to code this, mainly in um, the Human Nutrition Research Unit in Cambridge. So they developed a software called Dido, which was then um, upgraded to Dino, and this software kind of automates the process and it has been used in the National Diet and Nutrition Survey as well as ALSPAC as well. 
So another study I wanted to point out was the 1970 birth cohort, and they did collect diet again across a number of time points. But what's particularly interesting is the 16-year dietary data. So there's diet information from multiple sources here, including parents, but there was also a four-day diet diary uh, collected in this study. But it hasn't actually been deposited, so it's not really accessible at the moment, and that was due to how it was coded. So I think this is a really good opportunity for some future work to be developed from this study. In the recent uh, data collection here as well, there was an online dietary data, which I think will be av available at some point this year as well. So Southampton Women's study was a little bit different from the other closer studies in that diet was one of the main aims of this study. So they've done extensive work uh, developing their food frequency questionnaire data from this. And Sarah, I think, is going to talk a little bit about the Southampton Women's study, so I won't go into it too much in detail here. But again, once you've collected the food frequency questionnaires from this <coughs> study, you still need to extract the nutrients from it. And again, how they did this was to allocate standard portion sizes from each a food item and combine it with food composition tables. So understanding society is one of the household panel surveys and although while they didn't look at a specific um, food frequency questionnaire or food diary, what they did have is some diet related questions and these really haven't been used that much in research and I think it's, it's quite interesting. They have a nice question um, about ethnic food consumption which I think could be explored a lot more in future. So the next uh, milestone was to look at what's been done uh, within each study. Um, and what I did, I wanted to see what's already been collected. But I think what's really important when you're um, interpreting result, dietary results from these cohorts is to understand the context in which they were done. So these are all the studies and the timeline in which they exist. So you have in 1952 the end of rationing, which would have directly impacted the children in the 1946 British birth cohorts. Then during the 1960s till the 1980s, you have this women's liberation movement, the increasing things like refrigeration and microwaves being available in people's homes, uh, women returning to the workforce, massive increases in uh, food technology. So there was like this massive increase in uh, convenience food consumption, which would have directly impacted the diets of participants around that time as well. Then you have the re-establishment of the dietary recommended values in the 1990s, as well as the BSE outbreak. And there is a nice study within the 1946 British birth cohort that has looked at the changes in meat consumption around that time. It's quite interesting. Then from 2000, you have the introduction of sort of health-related nutrition policies. So you have the Healthy Star campaign, you have the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition was established, and you have the Five a Day campaign in 2003, and the School Fruit and Vegetable Scheme, which again would have potentially impacted the diets of people at that time. Then more recently, you have things like the public concern for sustainability and the rise in sort of more plant-based um, foods, as well as the sugar tax uh, just last year. So I think it's really important when you're interpreting these studies just to keep all of these things in mind in the background. So I did a little uh, non-systematic review to see how many studies were actually already existing using this data. And apart from ALSPAC, there doesn't really seem to be that much. So I'll go through two, two studies and kind of give you an idea of what can potentially done, be done with this dietary data. So this was a study done in 1999 that compared the diets of children in 1950 to the diets of children in 1990. And the 1990 data comes from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. So what they found was that children in the 1950s tended to eat more uh, vegetables and bread and less uh, soft drinks, which I think is, isn't that surprising. So they tend their um, sort of nutrient rec guidelines were more in line with uh, what we would want them to be, except for fat. But what I think is really interesting is if you look at the source of iron in 1950, it was coming from things like meat. But by 1990, it was coming from things like fortified breakfast cereals. And similarly with vitamin C, the source of vitamin C in 1950 was coming from vegetables. But by 1990, it was becoming, coming from things like soft drinks. So I think that's quite a nice example of what we can do in comparison, uh, comparing diet over time with these studies. So another study um, that's been done with um, the 1946 British birth cohort is one that I did last year looking at the DASH diet. And that's the dietary approach to stop hypertension. It's basically a diet that's high in fruit and vegetables and whole grains. And 
It was developed from a trial um, that looked at its, um, how it would affect hypertension, and it's been shown to be quite effective in that. But what hasn't been shown is whether it's effective in terms of long-term intake. So what we did was we used the dietary data from participants when they were aged 36 to 60 to 64 years, so over a 30-year time period, and see whether this like long-term adherence to this diet was associated with cardiovascular risk factors. So what we saw that, yes, higher adherence to this diet was associated with a better cardio cardiovascular risk profile, and we were also able to look at it in relation uh, to some more novel as aspects of uh, cardiovascular function. So these two studies are just an example of what can be potentially done. So we can look at uh, using one study to look at the longitudinal nature of, of uh, uh, diet, and then we can look at secular changes as well. So the next milestone was to see whether diet can actually be harmonised across these studies. And I think it's quite clear where the sources of heterogeneity are between the cohorts. So in terms of the dietary instrument itself, so some use established dietary assessment tools, some don't. And even within those established tools, the instrument <coughs> details are quite different. And there's also differences in coding. I do think there is some potential for harmonisation. So it, again, it comes back to what are you trying to harmonise and what is the research question that you're interested in? Are you interested in a specific food group? Um, there are different methods that you can use to do that. You can collapse it into the largest denomination between the studies. But the first step, I think, with any sort of harmonisation is to develop quite extensive metadata, and, and that's what the, the point of this project. I kind of just wanted to finish then on a last slide um, just to show you why I think this is important again. So this is a paper uh, by Will Johnson in 2015 that I'm sure some of you are aware of. But basically what it's showing is that um, younger generations are becoming overweight and obese from younger ages. And then David Ban's work following up from that uh, last year showed that not only were they becoming more overweight from younger ages, but the social inequalities in this was increasing as well. And for me, this kind of points to something that's gone quite wrong in public health policy. And diet is only one part of this really complex obesity problem. But if we can look at similar rates of change with the dietary data, we can potentially point to some sort of um, health policy or nutrition policy that is effective and equitable. So I'd really appreciate any comments or suggestions where we can go with this diet data. <coughs>